I am so excited to be here with you all and to welcome you, welcome you to Team of Washington, Athletes as Leaders. I'm Elizabeth Montoya. I'm with the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And we work together with over 70 member programs all across the state of Washington to create a world where, where all people can live and love freely and without fear. And Team Up Washington is a big piece of that work. Um, we're all working together to create these safe and healthy and thriving communities. So I'm gonna start out by acknowledging that across the state, we are always gathering on the ancestral homelands of indigenous nations who have lived here from time immemorial. From the Spokane tribes to the east, the confederated tribes of the Yakima nation to the south, the Macaw tribe to the west and the Lummi nation to the north and so many more, we, honor you and thank you for your stewardship of the land and waters. I live in the traditional lands of the Lactamish and Nooksack people in Bellingham, Washington. And if you know the traditional lands that you are on, feel free to put that in the chat. And if you don't know, you can go to native-land.ca to find out. So you may be familiar with that website. One of the most exciting things that we get to support um, at Wiscative is this amazing work empowering young athletes to become leaders in the movement to end violence and to address some of those root causes that allow for violence to happen in our communities. So Team Up Washington is a partnership between the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Harborview Abuse and Trauma Center, and LifeWire. So we are building on the incredible work that Rebecca and Monica, who you'll be hearing from today, have led to leverage sports as a platform to end sexual assault and dating abuse. Dating violence and sexual assault assault are 100% preventable. We can absolutely stop this from happening. And the way we're gonna get there is with all of you. So the conversations you will start with these programs will empower student athletes to lead the way and shift culture both on and off the field in their schools and in their communities. And we at the coalition are so excited to support this work. We're gonna start with a video that's going to give you a brief overview of what Team of Washington is all about and the impact that it has in our communities. So you can go ahead and start the video, Anna. Thank you. Team Up Washington uses sports as a platform to end sexual assault and dating abuse. Our initiative expands the reach of coaching boys into men and athletes as leaders to violence prevention programs for high school athletes. Since 2019, we've brought coaches, athletic directors, advocates, and mentors together for trainings on how to implement these programs to create change in our schools, communities, and in our homes. Our goal is to support communities to take on violence prevention across Washington State by leveraging the power of sports. Here's how. One and a half million high school students experience physical abuse at the hands of someone they're dating um, nationally every year. We know that one in four girls and one in six boys will experience sexual assault before they turn 18. You know, the good news is, is that sexual assault and domestic violence and teen dating abuse, these are things that are 100% preventable. We can totally end this. And the way we're gonna get there, you know, the path towards that prevention is right here. It's with all of you in this room and we can do that together. And it gives me um, so much hope and joy for our future. All genders, all kids, all athletes, all students play a role in preventing violence and creating a safer community for everyone. All of us who have had a coach that's inspired us know the power of that coach, the, the power that they have. Um, the amount of time we spend around the coaches is just so much that when they are teaching us those character lessons as well. It can make a big difference in all of our lives. The lessons they learn about dignity, self-respect, how grace, how they carry themselves, are how they're gonna take themselves to the world. And so we're not teaching them to be athletes, we're teaching them to be human beings. We make a difference. And what I say and challenge each of you to do is to make that difference something that's powerful for our young people. I think when athletes are coached with the expectations that they will positively innovate their own lives and their own communities, 
they will rise to these expectations. These athletes have so much power, so much clout, um, so much influence over their classmates. Let's use every ounce of that that we can to make a positive difference. When we show athletes through example that they have the ability to change the world, they will. Hundreds of coaches across Washington State have been trained and are implementing this in their community. Coaches and teams are having conversations about relationships and community standards across our state, and we are all the better for it. Join the team. Visit teamupwa.org and be a part of the movement for a better future. Thank you, Anna. So you may have caught a glimpse of this young woman in the video we just watched. Our keynote speaker tonight is an incredible activist, athlete, and leader in the movements to end violence. She is a member of the Cowlitz tribe and from the Muckleshoot Reservation. She's a nationally recognized athlete and runs for the University of Washington's track and field team. She's also an activist who raises awareness for missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and relatives. And she regularly speaks out on the importance of taking action to prevent violence and build safe and thriving communities. I am so honored to welcome our uh, wonderful colleague and friend, Rosalie Fish. Um, so, Liat Esklechad, Rosalie Fish, Sleetsta, Bakushu Zabshad. Um, hello, my name is Rosalie Fish. Uh, I just introduced myself in the traditional Hoshutsid language. Um, I currently reside on Puyallup land and acknowledge the past, present, and future caretakers of the Puget Sound area, which are the Coast Salish people. Um, before I get started, I just want to start off with a brief trigger warning. Um, there will be mentions of uh, suicide, violence, and sexual harassment, and racism. Um, if you need to step away at any moment, please feel free to take a breather. Um, I definitely won't be offended or anything like that. Um, I am an athletic advocate for the missing and murdered Indigenous women crisis. I am from the Cowlitz and Muckleshoot tribes, um, and I run cross country and track for the University of Washington. Um, I really want to start my story from the beginning. Storytelling is traditional, and I have the honor of sharing my story with you all today and of how I made my transition from a victim to a survivor. There we go. Um, so I first experienced racism in elementary school. The first time I realized I was different was when I watched members of my tribe perform traditional Coast Salish canoe family dances and songs on stage um, at an event school event in Auburn, Washington. Uh, I instinctively walked up to join them and I was drawn to our beat. Uh, I grew up stories, hearing stories of how resilient my ancestors were, how I am a descendant of vibrant people who persevered and danced, who sang and survived. I learned about my great grandfather, George Cross Jr. and my other family member, Henry King George, who were jailed for fighting discriminatory hunting and fishing laws. I felt proud when I heard these stories. When I got off stage though, I felt flushed with embarrassment as my classmates began to mock me. I regretted performing the dance and I began to feel self-conscious and ashamed. I was teased for wearing my moccasins and the older I got, the more I was mocked for representing my culture and my heritage. It was made clear to me that I was different and I didn't belong. Eventually I couldn't take it and I started to embrace my cultural practices only on the reservation and I tried to blend in while I was at school. I entered ninth grade as most 14 year olds do. I was insecure, passive and looking for some kind of direction. I was uncomfortable with my sexual orientation and my place in social settings. Unfortunately, my classmates only continued to mock me as I got older. For the first half of my freshman year in high school, I often faced microaggressions and racist comments. I was sexually harassed and as other students, particularly athletes, grabbed, pinched, and catcalled young girls like me. I felt violated and I blamed myself. 
between being indigenous, being queer, and being a girl, I felt completely isolated in school settings. And things at home weren't much easier. Domestic violence was present in my home and I suffered severe depression by the age of 14. I felt as if I would never belong at school, internalizing years of messaging that girls who looked like me had no place. I'd look at myself in the mirror, fixate on every part of my body and think there's nothing to love about me. I ran occasionally, but I didn't yet consider myself a runner. Every day I felt more alone and I thought that nobody wants to hear what I have to say. I was prescribed antidepressants, but began excessively using them. I felt as if I didn't have any value, as if I didn't deserve to take up space. I felt hopeless and just so tired. Then on February 9th of 2016, I attempted to take my own life at 14 years old. There were so many opportunities for prevention, but no one intervened. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in youth ages 18 to 10 years old. At the 1964 Olympics, Native American Billy Mills shocked the world and came behind to win the gold medal in the 10K race. Since then, he has dedicated his life to serving American Indian communities. He once said, your life is a gift from the creator. Your gift back to the creator is what you do with your life. It was not always easy to view my life as a gift. Sometimes it felt impossible. I was fortunate enough to survive my attempt and be brought to the ER and I spent my 15th birthday in with my family recovering my um, or celebrating a partial recovery. I then enrolled at the Muckleshoot Tribal School. At tribal school, running became a part of my recovery. I started running every day thinking it could help calm me down and center me. It had been a hobby and not a refuge, but now it was slowly becoming so much more to me. It made me feel safe and seen. It made me, it brought me joy and peace, a sense of belonging. And so I'd run. I'd run through the reservation, past the cedar trees, the neighbors waving by as I whirled across them. I became obsessed with the feeling of the wind hitting my face as I picked up speed. Running empowered me and made me feel valuable. This didn't stop the discrimination though. When I ran at Muckleshoot, I was running to represent my community. When I arrived at track meets in a tribal school uniform, I was perceived by rivaling schools as a joke. Despite my qualifying times, I was excluded from large invitational meets due to my school size. I had been asked if I even owned a uniform. During an event, a rival school put, had put graffiti in the women's bathroom. Offensive slurs such as Indian savage were plastered on the stalls. This bathroom was the same bathroom that my little siblings used and the elementary and middle schoolers used. It became apparent to me that I can't protect the Muckleshoot Tribal School youth from the racism and prejudice of others. However, I could prove these biases wrong. And the best way I could do so was through running. I realized that even if I hadn't meant to, that being an athlete gave me a spotlight in my community. The youth at my school knew my name. They were watching me at a platform. I met my coach in my senior year of high school, and his name is Coach Mike. By the time we met, I had been easily winning small meets, and I liked it that way. I was scared off from bigger meets after being discriminated against. I wanted to stay comfortable, stay achievable. Coach Mike started pushing those boundaries. He started enrolling me in larger invitational meets and giving me harder workouts. I started to think, I am not going to get along with this guy. But here's what changed. Coach Mike wasn't challenging me because he thought I was lazy or because he thought I wasn't working hard enough. He challenged me because he believed I could compete with the best. He knew I deserved to be seen and he understood how impactful it was to have me shine as an athlete and a leader in my community. Coach Mike started pushing back on the discrimination I faced. He confronted race officials. By the end of our season, I was competing in the 2019 state championships in four events. Weeks before the championships, I received inspiration from Lakota runner Jordan Marie Daniel to dedicate my four races to the missing and murdered Indigenous woman crisis. Through Coach Mike's coaching, I felt confident. 
I was achieving goals and winning races I had never dreamed of, but he knew that I could do it all along. His belief in me turned to self-belief. I felt empowered and ready to make a difference. I felt ready to race for something bigger than myself. I brought the idea up to him and he reminded me that even though we both knew there would be spectators and competitors who would disagree and push against what I was doing, we'd faced it before and we wouldn't let it stop us. I painted a red handprint over my mouth to represent the indigenous women that have been silenced through violence along with the letters MMIW on my right leg. After I received each medal, I brought it to the poster display where I gifted it to one of the women I was representing. I won the 1600 for my aunt, Alice Looney, who disappeared from Wapato and was found 15 months later deceased with no answers from police. I won the 800 meter race for Jacqueline Sawyers from the Puyallup tribe. She was pregnant at the time of her death and a mother of four who was killed by Tacoma police in 2016 as he was attempting to arrest her boyfriend. The officer was not held accountable and was cleared by a review board of his own peers. I won the 3200 for Renee Davis, a member of my Muckleshoot community. Renee and her unborn son, Mossy Molina, whom she was pregnant with at the time, were shot and killed by Auburn police and King County sheriffs during a welfare check while her other two children were present. And I dedicated my sportsmanship medal to Mossy. My last race was the 400 meter for Misty Upham, a member of the Blackfeet Nation and a successful actress who was invited to the Golden Globes for her performance in the film Frozen River. Misty was found deceased in the bottom of a ravine by my reservation after Auburn police did not look for her and mislabeled her death as a suicide. The 400 meter race was already a little bit out of my comfort zone. I had raced it as a workout during a meet early in the season and unexpectedly ran a state qualifying time. Before the last race, Coach Mike came to talk to me. He said, I know your legs are tired, but you don't care. You don't care that your legs are tired. You don't care that you haven't had a break yet because you're running for more than this medal. He said, you're running for Misty and Jackie and Renee and Alice but you're also running for your little sister Solstice and your older sister Cedar. You're running for my daughters, Nyala and Khalil. You're running for all of the little girls at tribal school and running for indigenous women everywhere. He said, that matters most to you, not how tired you are. I placed second with a personal record for Misty. I finished the meet as a three-time state champion and a silver medalist, but most importantly, I made an impact on my community, raised awareness to a cause important to me, and became a leader in the running world, and held myself accountable in using my platform to create change. I have never stopped running for missing and murdered Indigenous women. When Coach Mike and I met, I was not the ideal athlete. I had relapses in my mental health, I had poor self-confidence and would even miss practice due to issues at home. I had no intentions of going to college. By the end of my senior year, Coach Mike attended my signing ceremony and I became the first athlete from Akoshu Tribal School to sign a collegiate letter of intent. Shortly into college, Coach Mike attended my first TED Talk. Later, he cheered me on for my first collegiate national championship. This year, Coach Mike watched me testify for Wiscative on a house bill that could be some of the first steps to ending the missing and murdered Indigenous women crisis in Washington State. Because of his support, I grew into the person that I needed to see six years ago. He fought battles against discrimination that I didn't have the strength to fight. He stood by me despite my mental health and my issues at home. He believed in me when I couldn't find a way to believe in myself. He advocated for opportunities he knew I deserved. You have and will continue to coach athletes who have been victims, athletes who are impacted by violence, athletes who are missing the support they need, athletes who have social issues they care about, and athletes who have the potential to change the world. You can be the spark to a fire of change. Change in an athlete's life, change in your community, change in legislation, change in the world as we know it. I started my sport as a means to survive. And through newfound coaching support, 
I now run at the division one collegiate level. I now run for something bigger than myself. You can be the spark. Every athlete has the potential to be leaders, to be change makers. We just have to treat them like they can. Thank you for your time today and for hearing my story. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you for your words and your advocacy and your leadership. It's such an honor to have you here and to have you telling your story and running for missing and murdered indigenous women and relatives. Um, it means so much to have your advocacy in this space. And I thank you. Thank you so much. And I see there's a lot of comments in the chat thanking you also for your, for your advocacy and for your work. Whew, I feel like I need to take a deep breath now as we transition and please feel free to do that yourself too. Um, those were really powerful words and a really powerful story. And as we move forward, we're gonna be thinking about how we can, how we can keep doing this work of, um, of supporting the young people in our communities and changing our communities to make sure that everyone feels safe and supportive supported and cared for. So I'm really happy to introduce two people who have uh, really been champions for this work in Washington. Monica Schell um, is the sexual assault prevention specialist for the Harborview Abuse and Trauma Center in Seattle. And she's worked in the fields of prevention and sexual health since 2011 and creates innovative content for young people related to consent and sexual assault prevention, including as a co-author of Athletes as Leaders, which is the curriculum we're going to be learning about today. And Rebecca Milliman is the Prevention and Education Manager at the Harborview Abuse and Trauma Center, where she has worked since 2008 to prevent sexual assault and help create safer communities. And she currently works with school districts to expand comprehensive sexual health education. Rebecca is a co-creator and author of Athletes as Leaders and a co-founder of Team Up Washington. And I'm so happy to pass the floor off to Rebecca and Monica now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that introduction. And Rosalie, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone tonight and thank you, express my gratitude for you being here. And it's really fun to have folks from all across the state. And I even see some of my colleagues in Hawaii and Alaska. It is wonderful to see you all. And again, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Rebecca Milliman. I use she, her pronouns and I'll hand it over to my co-presenter. Hi, um, I'm Monica Schell and I use she, they pronouns. So Monica and I come from the Harborview Abuse and Trauma Center. For those of you who are not familiar, it is a local sexual assault program located in Seattle, Washington. And we provide services directly for survivors and also provide prevention and education services in the community, which is what Monica and I do. And we do recommend also watching our overview webinar if you have not done so already. So on the Athletes as Leaders website, there is a training page and one of my colleagues will put that in the chat and you will see a webinar number one, which is a one hour webinar that will provide an overview of the Athletes as Leaders program. You'll learn more about the program goals, the core principles, as well as the key messages of the program and the results of our national evaluation. So next up, we are actually going to watch a video. Um, this video is called Sisters in Sweat and it features Serena Williams. It contains her special message uh, to her newborn daughter. Baby girl, I won't mind if you play tennis badly. I won't mind if you choose to never pick up a racket, but I beg you, in this game of life, please keep playing no matter what. Just like it taught me 
Sports will teach you to be strong. Lions on three. One, two, three, Lions! You'll discover the power and grace for your body. You'll learn to move, and you'll learn the way to move others. Sports will teach you the strength of your allies. Whether your bond is by blood or by ball. Whether she shares the color of your skin or the color of your jersey. You'll find your sisters in sweat. Sometimes you'll score goals, sometimes you won't. But the goals you set, you'll reach together. You'll find the courage to stand tall, work harder, and speak louder on whatever playing field you choose in life. So keep playing, my girl. Okay, so next up, we are actually going to put you in breakout rooms, and they'll be very, very small groups to give you a chance to introduce yourself um, to your partner who you're paired up with, and we want you to discuss this question. So for those of you who were involved in sports at some point in your life, what lessons have you learned from sports that have helped you in life? And I have to say, Rosalie's story is so powerful on so many levels, and she really spoke to this. Um, in case you were not involved with sports, you can talk about something else that you're passionate about or another hobby or activity um, that you were involved with as a young person or currently, and what lessons that have helped you in life that you've learned from that. Okay, so hopefully you got to meet someone new and share a little bit more about what lessons you have learned from sports that have helped you in life. I would love to ask for a few volunteers if you're willing to share uh, the impact that sports had on you uh, in the chat. That would be great. If anyone's willing to share, please put a lesson that you have learned from sports that have helped you in life. And I can start with myself. So I was an athlete growing up and I had an incredible coach that pushed me really, really, really hard. And it was a year round sport. I was a swimmer. So it was a year round sport and you're spending every single day of your life um, in the pool and you end up being really close, very developing really close relationships um, with your coaches and with your fellow athletes. And I really, really learned um, about the importance of hard work and per perseverance and also kind of having, you know, as soon as you achieve a goal that you've set to set a new goal. So you're always moving forward and looking forward. Let's see what other folks have said. So Nan said practice, long game endurance, teamwork. Everyone has something to contribute. And there's a surprise hero in each game. I love that. Monica said the importance of collaboration. Absolutely. Ellie said how empowering sports can be, especially for young women. Awesome, thank you. Learn how to win and lose with dignity and grace. That is such an important life lesson. Uh, teamwork, managing time, because you're always balancing sports with everything else. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay. We'll move on, but I welcome you to continue to put your comments in the chat. So I wanted to share a brief background about the Athletes as Leaders program. So this is something that uh, we created in Seattle um, at a local high school who was very interested in leveraging the power of sports um, to create change in the community. So this particular uh, high school, shout out to Garfield High School, is a big sports school and athletes do tend to be leaders in this community and also quite a few students in the school play at least one sport. And I met with the school leadership and they expressed interest in doing uh, the Coaching Boys into Men program, which many of you are probably familiar with. And we'll put the link to their website in the chat. We also, for Team Up Washington, are offering a train the trainer on that program next week. 
So Coaching Boys into Men is a leadership program for athletes on boys teams. And um, basically the school principal wanted to do that program with every team. And so we immediately thought, well, what about the girls teams, right? The girls teams need access to leadership opportunities. And also they have a big influence on the school climate and the school culture. And also when we're talking about preventing relationship violence and sexual assault, young women and girls are disproportionately affected by this issue. So they should have a big voice at the table to prevent these issues from occurring in the first place and to create a safe and welcoming community for everyone at the school. And on the next slide, Monica is going to tell you a little bit more. Thanks, Rebecca. So um, the program is all about developing student athletes as leaders. Um, it is a program that encourages athletes to create a safe and supportive community on their teams and at their schools. Um, it is based on research and best practices in sexual assault prevention. So we do recommend um, this program as a complement to other programs that involve men and boys in active prevention efforts. Um, the boys teams in our community have done the Coaching Boys into Men uh, program and Athletes as Leaders uh, was created so that women, girls, non-binary people, um, and gender non-conforming folks um, could all have an active voice in creating a safe community. Um, it is best practice to intentionally target all genders because everyone can play a role in preventing violence. Next slide, please. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna watch a video to hear from athletes who have actually gone through the Athletes as Leaders program. Most people look up to athletes and think like that they're a role model that they can follow. I don't know, high school is definitely a time where you become like more self-conscious and aware of yourself with everything you're doing. There's no better time to learn about these things than right now because it's kind of when we need it the most. So sessions are a really intimate experience. I think for the team, it's a great bonding experience for everyone. We're down in the theater room, having just a normal conversation about things that happen you know, in everyday life and things that are difficult to talk about in other situations, but it makes it a really comfortable space. We talk about how relationships should be and what respect looks like. A few weeks ago, we were talking about consent and inequalities. What I took away the most was that there are other people who care about this too. It gets that conversation going. A lot of the things that I learned from it had to do with when a relationship is in a healthy relationship. You know, it really, it really like let me express how I'm feeling and it let me be who I wanted to be in there. And so when we leave, we just feel like a better person. We feel more confident in our game. You can expect to like learn a lot about your team and other people and kind of step into other people's shoes and think from their perspective. The more you participate and the more like you actually try to learn from it, the more you'll actually get from it. There are a ton of valuable lessons that you can learn and like we're more bonded and more of a community.
So this program is based on social norms theory. And so I would say this is less of an educational curriculum and more at an, a program, more of a program that attempts to change and shift social norms. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with social norms theory, it is very fascinating and I encourage you to, to explore it. But basically what it entails is this idea that adolescents particularly, but really folks of all ages are highly influenced by their peers and folks that they care about. And for adolescents, particularly young women and girls, there is so, many, so much messaging to them in society about the way that they're supposed to be. And for student athletes, there are additional messages that often say that they have to do things a certain way. They have to carry themselves a certain way. They have to be excellent at everything. It is a lot of pressure. And we also know that they are highly influenced by their peers. And there's actual research that shows that their behaviors do vary depending on what they think other people around them are doing. So the classic example is a research study that was done on college campuses that showed when a student arrives at a college campus and where the common perception is that this is a big party school, everyone drinks and uses drugs very often. There's a lot of binge use and individual students use of alcohol and drugs will go up. But when the perception is, is that this is not a party school, a lot of folks are not using uh, drugs and alcohol, then an individual's use goes down. And so we use the social norms theory in athletes as leaders to basically say, you know, you are a leader in this community. You actually do have a lot of social influence and we want you to take that seriously. We want you to use that for good. And so this is a unique aspect about this program. It's very reliant on the team aspect. And these discussions get really deep sometimes. Athletes do share a lot about things that they care deeply about and the way that they want themselves and their peers and their teammates to act and how they want um, them to treat other people. So next, I'm going to hand it over to Monica for a discussion question. Thank you. All right, so we have a discussion question. Um, we'd love to hear from y'all. What are some of the societal messages that are given to young people who are raised as girls to prevent rape and sexual assault? Um, so go ahead and unmute if you have any thoughts or uh, share in the chat. Just conservative. Be careful where you go at night or don't go out at night at all, for sure. Anything else? Always watch your drink. Check in regularly, don't go alone, carry whistle, don't get drunk, uh, don't draw attention to yourself, learn self-defense, carry your keys between your fingers. I still do that. Make wise choices. Um, don't go out with those kinds of boys, quote unquote. Don't wear too much makeup, interesting. Yeah, um, <laughs> so Athletes as Leaders is unique because unlike many common sexual assault prevention messages, um, it does not put the burden on people to protect themselves. So basically we're trying to avoid a lot of those messages you just brought up in the chat. Um, these messages put the responsibility on people to protect themselves um, from being sexually assaulted. These messages ultimately tend to blame the victim um, instead of the person who actually perpetrated the assault. Um, when creating this program, we wanted to think about athletes on girls teams specifically and the harm they may be causing and how to prevent it. Um, these include some of the more normalized forms of sexual assault and harassment, such as body shaming, harassment and bullying, including on social media, uh, rumor spreading, 
sexual shaming, victim blaming, and reinforcing negative stereotypes about specific genders, racial groups, uh, sexual orientations, and disabilities. So next, I'm going to clarify some of the key roles for the Athletes as Leaders program. So first of all, the mentor is the person who builds the relationships and mentors the teams. And this is the person who's actual or people, person or people who are actually facilitating the sessions, the athletes as leaders sessions with the athletes. And so tonight you are getting a train the trainer for mentors. Some of you will end up serving as mentors for teams and other, there's also other folks in the room who serve in some of these other roles as well. But basically tonight you're getting everything you need to facilitate the program. Um, the advocate is the violence prevention professional. They often, you know, someone like Monica or myself, they're often someone who works at a local domestic violence program or sexual assault program. And they are your content experts. They can be folks that provide training for mentors. They can help, you know, advocate to get this set up in a school in the first place, building those key relationships with stakeholders. And basically they can kind of oversee the coordination of the program. You saw me in one of those videos. Uh, in that case, I was both the advocate and the mentor. I was the one coordinating it, you know, building relationships and getting this started in the school with uh, working closely with the athletic director and the principal and the assistant principal, but also I was a mentor. So I was directly working, like in that video, you saw me working with the volleyball team, facilitating the program. Obviously the athletes are key to this program. This program is very reliant on athlete participation for them to set the team norms. And you wanna kind of rely on your team leaders to help you lead the discussions. And then lastly, the coach. So the coach, obviously you know who that is. They are the team administrator. They're gonna be the one to reinforce the messages when you're not doing athletes as leaders. So in the middle of practices and at games and when they're traveling and also the connection with the parents. Now, sometimes the coach is the mentor. So again, the coach of the team, either the head coach, the assistant coach can also be the mentor to facilitate the program. And next, I just wanna briefly talk about how to identify mentors. And sometimes you have to get creative with who this might be. So to be totally transparent, um, sometimes I have worked with a lot of girls teams who are coached by male identified folks. And so a lot of the coaches who I have worked with um, kind of recognized uh, the sensitivity of some of the topics um, around, um, you know, what athletes as leaders covers. And also sometimes we would ask the athletes who they would prefer as a mentor. And you really want to consider the identities of that person. It is, it is important. So in general, most of the time, we recommend a female identified or non-binary or gender non-conforming person. This is not a requirement, um, but this program does address sensitive and nuanced topics with athletes, including sexual assault, relationship abuse, shaming, body image, gender stereotypes, like Monica said. So the mentor really needs to be aware of their own personal experiences with this and how they relate to these topics. And so sometimes folks who have been raised as girls or who have experienced that type of gender socialization in our culture, they might be more comfortable discussing some of these topics due to a deeper understanding. Um, we do recognize a lot of girls teams have male identified coaches. And so sometimes the coach will partner with a mentor from the community. And that can be an advocate, that can be an alumni, that can be team captains. We, I, I facilitated this with the soccer team and we had the team captains as the leaders of the discussion. Um, and so you just really want to kind of identify who do the athletes think would be the best person to mentor them. And we also have a document that um, someone, thank you, Kendall, for putting that in the chat. So we have a whole document that explains all of this. Some of the other things that we've heard from young athletes about who they prefer as a mentor. So they prefer a near peer. Uh, they prefer diverse mentorship, like folks who really represent the identities of the folks that they're mentoring. You also want to consider training. You know, you're getting the basic training tonight, but ideally you want folks that do have a deeper understanding of some of these concepts and um, experiences. It's very important to get a full season commitment. This is a 10 session program. So it generally runs 10 weeks. 
but I've worked with a golf team that only had a six week season. So you want someone that will commit to the whole season and really what's most important and really the only true requirement is that this person is really passionate about creating a safe and respectful community for all. We want them to be authentic and to really be bought into the messages of the program. And so next up, I'm actually gonna to try to, I'm going to attempt to navigate you through the website. So here is the website, it's athletesasleaders.org. Anytime you click here, you'll go back to the main page. But what I wanted to point out is a little bit about how this is set up. So I saw on the registration, a lot of you are advocates. And so a lot of you are gonna be in that coordination role. So you have an entire step-by-step -step process here that will walk you through all the steps to get this up and running at a local high school or a local sports organization. And at the bottom here, you'll see what we call the toolkit. And so there's lots of great resources here that we will not go into all of these tonight, but highly encourage you to check out each one of these before getting this started in your community. And here you'll see a training page and it's possible that actually tonight's webinar will be posted there. We also have that overview webinar that I mentioned earlier, as well as an advanced training that's on there as well. And you'll see everything like, you know, even sample parent letters sometimes, well, I would recommend all the time you want to alert families that their students are going to be getting this program. And so here's a template that you can use for that. And we even have kind of the background information, what research articles and the, uh, theories we base this program on. So check it out. It is under the Advocate Toolkit. Next step is the mentors. So you're at the mentor training tonight. And again, step-by-step. Step. And if you scroll down, you'll see the toolkit for mentors. The Teams tab includes resources and information for coaches as well as athletes. And then lastly is the program. And so the program actually has every single session here. And I believe everyone who's attending tonight will also be mailed a hard copy of this as well. So some people like the the electronic version and some people like to have it, you know, hold it in your hand uh, while you're facilitating. I personally like to have it printed out. And so I'm just going to show you one session as an example. So I'm going to choose session eight, which is fostering healthy relationships. And I'm going to go ahead and click on this to show you the format that we used in each session. We tried to make it really user friendly. And the first section, you'll see materials that you need to gather beforehand. We, again, tried to make this program where it can literally be facilitated anywhere. Like we've done this on the, the basketball court. We've done this outside on a softball field. We've done this in bleachers. We have done this um, in a classroom. And so you don't really need a lot of materials, but the prep that is required will be listed here. Every session also has two or three key messages. And these are not necessarily things that you need to read to the athletes right off the bat. Um, these are not things that you need to proactively share. This is a way for you as the mentor to get grounded with what are we really trying to get across here? What are the three main points of this session? And so you can see here for the relationships lesson, these are the key messages. And what I like about this is if it ever gets off track, if the conversation ever gets off track, because you only usually have about 20 or 25 minutes, depending on how much time the coach has given you to do this program, um, you can always bring it back to the key messages. So sometimes if you kind of go off on a tangent or the athletes are kind of getting off track, because my experience is they really have a lot of things they want to say, you can always just bring it back to the key messages. And each lesson after that will have the actual content for athletes. So we break it up into three sessions. The warm up is kind of your basic introduction. Sometimes there's a really short activity. This one is more just a script you can read. And you can see the script is just in regular font. The next session is called the workout and these are your discussion questions. So discussion questions will be always in bold and in italics, you'll see some possible answers. And again, those are just giving you ideas of generally what we've heard athletes say when we ask these questions. Um, but you don't need to give them the answers. They, they will have the answers. 
Sometimes it's an open-ended question. Sometimes it's a fill in the blank. And then this section ends with talking points. And you don't really necessarily need to share all of these. A lot of times what I have found is athletes will actually say a lot of these things. And so I just basically sum it up with the things I haven't heard them say. And when in doubt, just go to the last two, which always gives them a challenge. Um, and then as student athletes, as leaders, something for them to think about as they move forward after the session. And then lastly is the cool down. So the cool down is what we call the team talk. Um, this is where no matter how big your team is, you want to do this in a large group, whereas the, the workout can be done in small groups and you probably want to do it in small groups for a large team. I've facilitated this with teams of six athletes and also teams of 80 athletes. So depending on the size of your team, you, you want to break them up into small groups so they can speak, so they can be heard and they can have a chance to participate. But for the team talk, you do want to do this in a large group um, because it's very powerful for that social norms uh, reason. And every session you want to end with a, with a team cheer. It's just a really fun thing to do. And it's a great way for the veterans on the team to teach the new folks all the team cheers. And that's basically it. Okay, so next Monica and I are going to cover some tips for the mentors uh, to help make the groups more successful. And first off is engaging youth leaders. So I, uh, this program, as I've said a couple times, is really intended to create positive social norms on the team. This is a great opportunity to engage youth leaders who may be highly effective at changing social norms amongst their peers. So especially someone like me, who's quite a bit older than the athletes I am mentoring, I'm really gonna rely on them to step up and to be the ones to really, um, you know, hammer home those, those key messages. They're the ones that are really gonna set the tone and set the social norm. You're really encouraged to partner with the student athletes to help facilitate. You should consider those team captains and the team veterans and the upperclassmen, but also and think about other folks who would like the opportunity to lead or who maybe could be encouraged to take the opportunity to lead. These are folks who sometimes have really great ideas during the groups. Or you might notice that one of your athletes has really advanced knowledge on one of the topics, and so encourage them to step up. I usually like to talk to them ahead of time. Usually I start off with the team captains, and I'll say, hey, these are the key messages that we're going to go over today. Would you be willing to speak first when I ask the questions? And sometimes, like I said, we're, we're co-facilitating with the team leaders. Um, if you have a really large team and you break into small groups, you could, that's another great opportunity for those student leaders to step up in those small groups and help facilitate. And Monica's going to give you some facilitation tips next. Yes, this is a lot of information. Um, so uh, take time on your own to reflect on your own personal experiences and how they relate to the topics. Um, it's okay to share a brief personal reflection about how you relate to the topic, uh, but please keep in mind that you should be modeling good boundaries. So don't share anything that an athlete, parent, or administrator may think is inappropriate based on your role. Uh, prepare for each session in advance. Put yourself in the shoes of the athletes um, you'll be working with and think about what they will wanna get out of the session or how they might answer the questions and think about the topic. Um, while it is okay to read from the script, um, it will be more engaging to speak authentically with the group. Um, so try to prepare and study the content ahead of time. Um, you'll also want to be inclusive of all gender identities. Keep in mind that not all athletes who play on girls sports teams identify as a girl or a lady. Um, when getting the group's attention, try to avoid um, phrases like, okay, ladies, or um, any gender specific sort of terms. And instead use more inclusive terms like athletes, the school mas mascot, or the sports name. Um, you'll also wanna be inclusive of all sexual and romantic orientations. Um, for example, in the relationships lesson, the introduction um, includes the following statements. When we are talking about relationships today, we are talking about all types of relationships with a partner like people who are dating, hanging out, hooking up, and even just friends. This applies to all sexual orientations, including lesbian, gay, bisexual, straight, etc. Assume that some are dating already and some are not. Some may have experienced consensual sexual activity and others have not. 
Um, it is very likely that you will already have students who have experienced sexual assault or abuse. Sensitivity reminders are scripted in the lessons. Um, you also want to create a culture of consent or permission. Um, this means that facilitators will not ask athletes personal questions or to disclose any more um, than they're comfortable with. While participation and engagement can be encouraged and even incentivized, no athlete should be forced to participate. Um, with that said, it is certainly okay to call on a particular person or group, such as, is anyone on this side of the room willing to share or blank, what do you think? Um, you'll also wanna watch the clock. The 20 minutes does go by really fast, especially if you have a large group like Rebecca was saying. So um, aim to get a few responses to each question, <clears throat> excuse me, and get the conversation back on track quickly if they get off subject. Um, keep it moving. For the cool down, you can use a bean bag or ball or other sports equipment that the team uses to pass around like a talking piece. Um, for example, the only person with the ball should be speaking. The ball does not need to be passed consecutively around the circle. Instead, athletes can throw the ball across uh, the circle with the teammate who is ready. Depending on the energy level, um, you can encourage active engagement or encourage uh, rest and relaxation. And lastly, your enthusiastic approach and encouragement goes a really long way. Um, they have already had a really long day at school, so uh, we try to make it fun. If you have funding uh, to purchase snacks, we highly recommend that. Uh, try to be enthusiastic and validate their responses. Show empathy and concern for the sensitive topics. Next slide, please. Okay, and then our last tip, tip is going to be how to build relationships with teams. And this is particularly for those of you who are not already on the team. Obviously, if the coach is the mentor, if the coach is the one facilitating the program, they are already building in time for this, of getting to know their athletes and building their relationship with the team. But sometimes someone like me might be coming in from outside in the community and wanting to build a relationship with them. Because again, this is not just facilitating a program. This is about the relationship. And so you want to build in time for this. And so my best advice to you is become their biggest fan. Go to the games. Go to the school store and purchase the t-shirt or the sweatshirt. <laughs> Show up at the games and cheer loud. This is what I did for every single team that I mentored. This is uh, also can be really, really fun. And sometimes like I mentored a wrestling team, I had never seen wrestling ever. And so it was a great learning opportunity for me to learn about just the dynamics on the team and what the sport looks like and just the different rules of the game, learn the lingo um, that's part of, of, that, of that sport. Also learn the athletes' names. This can be really challenging when you don't see them regularly, but even at the games, I would study the roster and I would try to memorize everyone's name. You can also have them share every time they share what their name is and learn how to pronounce it correctly. That is a very important part of someone's identity. You also wanna ask the team leaders to help you, as I talked about earlier. Check in with that coach and develop a really close relationship with them. A lot of times we were texting each other and planning ahead for, you know, things that had popped up on the team. Like sometimes there was some kind of issue that had occurred and, and it was really helpful to know about that. Sometimes, you know, we're in Seattle, so there's a lot of rain here. And sometimes the practices got rained out or canceled. More likely a game would be canceled. And so their practice schedule would be adjusted because of that. And so you do have to be really flexible. And then lastly, modeling good boundaries. Of course, um, we come from the sexual assault field. So we're always going to advocate for modeling good boundaries. Um, it is important to develop a close relationship, but it's also really important to have good boundaries. And sometimes you might feel pressure to share a lot of personal information about yourself and you don't need to do that. Uh, you can show a lot of care and concern for athletes and what they're experiencing, um, but also remembering that there is that power dynamic there um, between a mentor and a mentee or an adult and a child. So what's gonna happen next is Monica is actually gonna be modeling one of the sessions for us. So Monica is going to step up as the mentor, and we want you to participate as if you are members of the team. So right now we are all going to join the team. We have joined a team together, and I'm going to hand it over to you, Monica. Yes. Are we still doing a poll for the team name? 
So we're going to do a poll uh, to determine what our team name is going to be. Um, hopefully that's something Anna can do because I don't know how. Okay. Um, so your options are the mermaids, otters, aardvarks, raccoons, or dolphins. So we got, it's the otters. All right. <laughs> that's the one last time. Wow. Go otters. Awesome. <laughs> so I guess we're doing a little cheer later. We have to remember that it's otters later on. Okay, so Monica is actually going to be uh, presenting this lesson or the session to us as if we are the athletes on the otters. Go otters. Um, but first, I just want to give you a little bit of background about this session. So this is called uh, Unpacking Beauty Standards, and it is session number five. And so the athletes are going to discuss how unrealistic beauty standards in society contribute to negative stereotypes body image issues, lack of confidence, and so on. The athletes are encouraged to consider positive characteristics about themselves and others that do not center around one's appearance. And so you can see the key messages are there are no right, there is no right or wrong way to have a body. No one should feel pressured to look or present a certain way. And lastly, avoid making comments about people's bodies. Um, okay, welcome everyone. Uh, let's pretend that last session we talked about addressing misinformation and bias. And today we're going to talk about unpacking beauty standards. Um, from a very young age, people receive messages about beauty standards from products, peers, the media, and their communities. Of course, we know these messages differ for certain communities, such as women and girls, people of color, people with larger bodies, the LGBTQ plus community, disabled folks, and so on. Many of these beauty standards are unrealistic and impossible to achieve. Oftentimes people feel pressure to change their body or appearance to fit this image. There's so much judgment about how people look and that can take focus away from all the other amazing things that people are doing in their lives. Beauty standards make people feel bad about themselves. Negative comments on people's appearance and bodies are so common that we often may not notice the damage they cause. Social media encourages us to compare ourselves to other people. It's important to remember that people's photos are often staged, perfectly posed, filtered, and airbrushed. There are people, influencers, and companies who profit from making people feel bad about their appearance. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide, which is our first sort of discussion question, which is what messages about beauty standards have you heard or seen? Please feel free to write in the chat or unmute if you're comfortable. Muscular bodies are not attractive. Interesting. Thank you, Sean. Any other ideas? Long lashes. I know so many who wear fake eyelashes or get the lashes put on. Women should wear makeup and no one else should. But also the makeup should look super natural. <laughs> All right, I think I'll move on to the next question, which is how do you think messages about beauty standards differ for certain communities like women, girls, people of color, and so on? Oh, someone wrote um, women should be thin, but not too thin. I think that's for that last question, but oh no, that could be for this one. Women and people of color are often held to high and unrealistic standards, that's for sure. White women tanning while women of color are discriminated because of their dark skin. Um, that is something I actually think about often is how, uh, yes, white people darken their skin. Um, so some of the talking points we have here are there is no wrong or, or right way to have a body. Um, someone's body is not a measurement of their worth. 
avoid commenting on other people's bodies, except maybe if you're trying to help a friend avoid embarrassment with an easy fix, like picking something out of their teeth or wiping something off their face. Social media, especially filters, contribute to unre unrealistic beauty standards, racism, negative body image, and lack of confidence. Remember, you can choose who you follow. Unfollowing or blocking people who make you feel bad about yourself is a form of self-care. It's never okay to fat shame others. People with larger bodies deserve love and respect just like everyone else. They are, are often mistreated in the medical field, the fashion industry, and in everyday life. Do your part to ensure that all bodies are respected. Clothes, hairstyles, and makeup are all forms of self-expression. They can be representative of people's cultures or communities. People should feel free to pre uh, present themselves however they're comfortable with, and we should celebrate that. When we go against society's beauty standards and maintain that there is no right or wrong way to present or look, then we are often we are also fighting against harmful gender and racial stereotypes. There are many things that we as a society need to unlearn. We need to unlearn that we need to have wrinkle and scar-free skin, that we're not allowed to gain weight, that we need to tan or lighten our skin, and that our body image defines our worth. So here's the challenge for you. Uh, when you see a new person at school or in your community, uh, catch yourself before judging their body, hair, skin, and clothes. Instead, get to know them. When you compliment a friend, see if it can first be about their personality, something they're good at, or something great that they did. As student leaders and athletes, it is important for you to uh, challenge harmful beauty standards and to look at people for who they deeply, for more deeply for who they really are. All right, now it's time for the team talk. Um, so if we were in person, we'd maybe be passing a ball or something like that. Um, but we're going to uh, think of things that you can all do as student leaders and athletes. Um, hopefully these will be things everyone in the group can agree to do uh, when you are interacting with people on your team, at school, on social media, or in the community. We are hoping we will become, they will become, excuse me, um, the new team norms that will help you take action as leaders in the community. Um, okay, so the next question is, what beauty standards would you like to unlearn? How can you unlearn them? Feel free to uh, write in the chat or on mute. Women and girls should present themselves as stereotypically feminine, and if not, their sexual orientation is questioned. What else? Lighter skin color is more beautiful. Want to unlearn that scars are ugly, especially in sports with injury and surgeries. Being thin will make you happy and attractive. How do people think we can unlearn any of these things? In terms of being thin will make you happy and attractive. I just started caring more about body neutrality than what my body looked like. So more so like what it does for me or how I feel. Any other ideas? I'll just unmute because it's hard to type, but <laughs> doing the, the being thin will make you happy and attractive. I think like exercising to feel good, like mentally, because it can help with like, you know, releasing endorphins and all of that, rather than like checking the weighing scale all the time to see if you've like dropped a couple pounds. So like not having weighing scales at all and just like focusing on more how you feel over time from exercising. That's a good point. Thank you for sharing that.
Okay, I think I'm going to move to the next question. Um, what are some positive things to notice or comment on about someone other than their appearance? Their laugh. That's a good one. Maybe their energy that they bring to a room. Good energy, someone just said that. Their care or thoughtfulness of others, their ideas, their contributions, small and big. Something they've accomplished recently, their kindness, their motivations. their effect on others. Okay, I'll move on to the next question, which I believe is the last one. Um, how can we use social media to promote the different ways we present ourselves? For example, when sharing or commenting on a picture or video. Something I saw someone do that I appreciated was um, if they edited their photo, they wrote in the description of the photo that it was edited and how they edited it. Or just posting unfiltered photos in general. Mention their feelings surrounding the photo. You must have been so happy. I love that. commenting and posting on what they slash we are doing, their accomplishments, their impact, rather than their appearance. Any other thoughts? I'm just gonna comment too, I can't type fast enough. I sure. just thought of this because of my uh, own daughters who are pretty active on social media. They really follow closely what the WNBA is doing around social justice issues. And they really follow their posts and their, what they're talking about. And I just see them, I just see those, those basketball players as big influencers. And um, it'd be interesting to talk about that amongst the team. Would they think about what they saw or what they're working on now or how they're addressing racism or addressing other equity issues like it's a pretty active plot it seems to me like just watching uh, secondhand it's a very active platform and they have a lot of discussion about it mm. and so seattle storm in particular they're like following what seattle storm players are doing and what they're talking about awesome okay i think i'll move on um so Thank you all for your participation and great ideas today. Um, you all have some awesome ideas on how to push back against beauty standards and judgments on appearance. So now it's time to break for the day and we have to do a team cheer. So I am gonna need everyone to unmute or, yes, unmute please. <laughs> you could write in the chat also, but it'd be cooler if everyone unmuted so we can say uh, go otters at the same time. <laughs> so I'll just give a moment for all those uh, microphones to go away. <laughs> okay, cool. So at the count of three, can we say go otters, please? Okay, one, two, three, go otters. Go otters. 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 <laughs> awesome, thank you. Yay, otters, thank you, Monica. So you had a chance to listen and participate in session five. And so now it's gonna be your turn. So we're gonna break you up into small groups of about four or five people. 
and you're going to take a turn at facilitating a session. So we'll put the link in the chat again for the program. And we're going to go ahead and let you pick the lesson or sorry, the session that you want to facilitate. If um, you get into the group, you might want to decide who in your group is very likely going to be actually implementing this program. Let's give them the first priority to practice the skills. And so if there's two of you that want to co-facilitate, I forgot to mention this earlier, but we had Monica do that one all, all by herself. But in general, when you have two facilitators, it's nice sometimes because you can kind of go back and forth on the talking points and take turns asking the questions. So if two of you want to step up, that's great. But really, we just need one awesome, amazing otter to step up and to facilitate a session. And we're going to let you pick which session you want. So challenge yourself. Um, don't give yourself the hardest topic or something that you've never talked about before. Um, go easy on yourself, but also don't make it too easy. So pick the topic that speaks to you the most. And again, the link is in the chat, um, athletesasleaders.org slash the hyphen program. And welcome back everyone. That was fun to get to see it in action. Okay. So I don't think there's really any need to go back to our slides because the only thing we have left is we wanted to open it up for some questions. Um, but first I wanna ask you a question. How was that for you, particularly the folks who were the facilitators, the ones who were acting as the mentors? If you wouldn't mind, if we have any volunteers who are willing to share about what that experience was like for you. And you could put it in the chat as well. I can share. Uh, I was the mentor in our group. Um, and I found myself, uh, I don't have my curriculum sitting in front of me. And so we opened it up on a, on a screen and we shared it. But um, I was a little bit unprepared to lead, although I had seen this lesson previously. Uh, and I think the lesson for me in this one was um, sometimes you you lead the best you can with what you have and to the best that you're prepared. Uh, and then afterwards, you just like any lesson, at any coaching plan, you would debrief as to how you can do better the next time. Uh, but sometimes you sometimes the intent and the honesty in which you bring to the discussion is what kids will see. And if you fumble with some of the words and you, you fumble with some of the delivery, they'll forgive you for that because they see the genuineness in, in your intent. So. Absolutely. Thank you. And we're, we're throwing you into this situation with, with literally no preparation. So you haven't really had the chance to, to prep. Um, and so I know that that was a big challenge, but I totally agree with you. I think just the way you come across your presentation, young people will see the authenticity and it also you know, we've tried to make it really scripted. So it is okay to just read the script if, if you need to, and that's fine. It does get easier with time for sure. How about others? So in the chat, Elise said, I facilitated the promoting consent lesson and was really appreciative of the participants answered and the honest dialogue we shared. Awesome. Yeah. And Honestly, like folks really will talk. I've, I've done this with so many teams. I've facilitated this program with dozens of teams and only one time did I have a group that was kind of quiet and it was a little bit hard to, to encourage that participation, but we got through it after session one or two, it got a lot easier. But in general, it's folks really want to talk about these things and it makes it a lot easier when you've got participants sharing openly. Thanks, Ellie. Do folks have any questions about the program? Anything that's come up tonight that you're curious about? Anything from coordinating this program, getting it started in a community, all the way to the finer details of implementing or facilitating? Anya said, I wish I had this program in my school when I was growing up. Thank you. Any other questions?
I, um, we, this came up sort of in, in our general talk and I thought it was an interesting question. It's like in, in our lesson, you know, kids are encouraged to make a decision about how much they want to share about something they experienced or not. And it just led us to thinking about like, how are people handling, you know, it, at one point, at different times and repetition, how are they handling explaining to young people, depending on their role, that they would have to talk to somebody else about abuse or something else they've experienced? Yes. Thank you for that question, Lee. So the question has to do with, you know, do you end up having students sometimes, student athletes disclosing abuse? And are we being open about the fact that some of us, depending on our role, would legally need to report certain things. And that, I'm really glad you brought that up. That is mentioned in the program and you will see that in the facilitation guide that we highly recommend that you share if you are a mandated reporter. And, <clears throat> excuse me, some people are and some people aren't. And so you'd have to check your state's laws because I know we have folks here from various states. For example, our high school coaches, mandated reporters, and sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. Some of our coaches are also teachers at the school. Sometimes you have you know, someone who's a social worker facilitating the program. And so you really wanna be honest with people if you're a mandated reporter and exactly what types of things you would need to report. I have also, one thing that I have done with young people and particularly teenagers, so high school students, is that sometimes they do wanna to talk to me. They know that I am a, at, at the core of my job, I am an advocate for survivors. And so sometimes they do wanna to talk to me, they do wanna ask me questions. And oftentimes it will be, can I talk to you after the group? I've never had someone disclose um, to report something to me in the middle of a group. Um, but sometimes folks will say, can I stay in after and talk to you? And so I will at that point remind them again that I'm a mandated reporter. And sometimes what I'll say is, if you just wanna ask me some general questions, but not name any names, um, that's one way to get kind of like professional advice from, a, from an advocate or a social worker without the fear of it being reported when you're maybe not quite ready for that. And sometimes they will do that, telling me about something that happened with a friend or you know, just not giving a lot of detail. Um, so at the end of the day, I think we should all be, I heard this in a training recently, I think we should all be mandated supporters, <laughs> not mandated reporters, right? We have an obligation to support the young people who we are serving. And so I really try to lead with that. What kind of support do you need and how can I help you get there? So I will stay on a couple of minutes after if folks want to ask questions in the chat, but I want to respect your time because we are at 730 and close up by saying that you will be, correct me if I'm wrong, Elizabeth, but I think folks will be sent a copy of the curriculum of the, of the program, a hard copy and, or Anna, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'll be sending out an email certificate to everyone who came and in that email, there will be a link to a training evaluation. So if you would like to um, be mailed a copy, please fill out that evaluation with your address. Great. Thank you. And thank you all so much for being here. I know this is a very long day and it is very late, except my colleagues in Hawaii, it's a little earlier for you, Ed, <laughs> not too late for you, um, but thank you so much for being here. And I'll stay on a little bit extra if folks want to ask me any questions and much gratitude for you for everything you're doing and feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'll put my contact information in the chat. And thank you, Monica, Elizabeth, Anna, and everyone for coordinating this and putting this on. And go Otters! Go Otters!